Good evening, everyone. I'm hoping this works. We have really not tried this out too much. Tim's going to unmute his mic. I'm here. Got it? Very good. Let us know if you can hear us okay, if you don't mind. Um, I, I'm always thinking, oh, it looks like the sound is coming through, so we're, we're in good shape this evening. Uh, I'm Andrew Dalton. I'm the director of the Adams County Historical Society. I'm here with Tim Smith, Adams County historian, our director of education, and we are going to do another installment of Ask a Historian, which is a program that we started doing during the pandemic from the screened-in porch at our old facility, and I have to say it's just so nice to be uh, in a beautiful place like this with a view we're looking off toward the first day's battlefield outside our our windows in our event center here and we have a stage and real microphones and chairs to sit in and um, it, it's just great to, to do this and have all of you watching I think I see there's already like 50 people joining us and we can't wait to uh, answer your questions mostly Tim will be answering your questions because he is the the, uh, the knower of all uh, here in Gettysburg. But thanks for joining us. Uh, throughout the program, we're going to also talk about some of our events that are coming up and announce a few things that are exciting um, on the horizon in the next couple months. So thanks for, for being with us tonight. And please feel free to start giving us some questions. Uh, I'm going to lead off with a question that was submitted earlier. Um, and that is just a personal question for Tim. You've been doing these segments every Monday on our YouTube page called Monuments Monday. And they're very popular, or Monument Monday. Monday. Uh, and uh, I wondered, and, and I think the, the question from earlier was, was uh, do you have a favorite monument on the Gettysburg battlefield? Yeah, I don't know if I have a favorite monument. I mean, it, that, that probably changes from uh, day to day or week to week or month to month. Uh, I really like the Pennsylvania monument. I like the idea of the thought put into it and all the names on the monument. And of course, when I was a tour guide, I spent a lot of time at that monument, you know, and sharing uh, stories about the regiments and the names on the monument with visitors. Uh, I really liked the stairway that leads to the top of the monument and some of the subtle things they did at the top of the monument. Um, I should, you know, interestingly enough, um, I was not on the top of the Pennsylvania Monument until they reopened it. It was closed from like, you know, the, it had a, the park put a gate up and put a lock on the door and wouldn't allow people to go up the stairs from like huh. the 1970s until the 2000s. I don't know when they reopened it. I do it. remember when it reopened. I think I was a kid, like okay. the early 2000s. Early 2000s. It was a big deal. Yeah. And, and you know, I had... I had, I, I, I like to say I was never in it, but the park gave us a key. Oh, really? You know, and the key, <laughs> my key happened to fit that. And um, <laughs> so um, I went up in it, but, you know, not, not legally. Not, yeah. Not, right. But um, uh, some of my park ranger friends had a, the same key, so we went up in it a few times. But um, I really like, like, at the top of it, how they have a, like, uh, you know, a compass on top, and it shows you where Baltimore and Washington is. You can see the fish hook. I, I, I really like that. Now, I'd probably say when I was a kid, my favorite was the 44th New York. I had pictures of me on the 44th New York <laughs> Monument on the top deck, maybe um, from the early 70s. Has like that always 72. been open to the top, the stairway yeah. inside? Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And uh, uh, although the handle doesn't go all the way to the bottom, people slip and fall down the steps all the time. I've seen people, you know, and you can even see the bottom step is really, you know, really it's a um, steep, worn uh, away. The so, angle going around yeah, it is not so easy. I've seen lots yeah. of people, especially kids, you know, because it's not very wide and you can't go up and down. But school groups do that all the time and they push each other and kids fall down the steps there a lot. Right. But um, uh, that's a really nice monument, too. I've always liked the 44th New York and, you know. It's 44 feet tall. I'll probably do a video really? on the 44th New I don't York think I actually point. knew that. I'm sure it's in 100 books, and I should know it. No, I don't think it's on 100. But, <laughs> um, I'd often, with uh, visitors, after we climbed up the mine and we're walking away, I'd stop them and turn around and say, okay, how tall is the 44th <laughs> New York Monument? Has anyone measured? I wonder if it's, it really is exactly. I feel like that might yeah, be. Well, the it. problem is the ground erodes away at the bottom. So oh, I guess I don't know right. where you have to start from to get 44, but right. it is. That's great. Okay, well, we'll get to these questions because we have a ton of questions coming in wow. rapidly. So I'm going to try to ask you, maybe you can try to keep your answers brief if okay. the question seems like a brief question just so we can get to, to as many of them as we can. Okay. Uh, the first question is uh, 
Uh, when soldiers say that civilians along the march handed them cakes, what are they referring to? Surely civilians didn't have time to make elaborate pastries. That's a great well, question. Well, I mean, um, Sally Myers mentions that, you know, she learns uh, when Buford's guys come in, that the infantry's coming in, and so they do spend the night before that cooking and getting ready for soldiers to arrive. And like on um, uh, June 29th, a visitor is in Emmitsburg and realizes the First Corps arrives and then rides into town and tells everybody that the army is coming and they're getting close and I'll be there the next day. And then Buford's guys arrive, but I think they were anticipating the First Corps arriving. So yes, in some sense, they knew the armies were coming and they prepared for it. Now. Cakes, is cakes, you know, referring to an actual cake or is it referring to like pancakes, you know, right. cakes made out of I've um, always thought pancakes. Flour. It was yeah. sort of just a simple, yeah, it's a simple pancake cake. that they could make quickly. Johnny cakes. Right. <laughs> or flapjacks. Yeah. yeah. Um, question about John Burns. Did he really fight at Lundy Lane? No. Okay. Good. With a question, a little context. Did, was he, he a never, combat veteran he of the War of 1812? action. In the War of 1812, he was in a unit near Philadelphia. Excellent. But now, a longer answer to that one is, uh, ironically, and maybe not, this is probably tied into the story, there was a company from Gettysburg that did serve on the Canadian border, and so he knew people that were at the Battle of Lundy's Lane and probably heard them talk about it, <laughs> and then later he just uses their story. That's great. Cl classic uh, John Burns. Who donated the bullet-ridden tailor shop sign? Well, there's a very specific question. Well, in our museum, a, I really like William that. T. King was a tailor mm -hmm. uh, in the square, we believe, right mm -hmm. in the center of the square of Gettysburg, mm -hmm. or shortly down Chambersburg Street on the left. And I know um, the answer to the question. Yeah, I don't, so go ahead. What is it? <laughs> so that object was donated by William McLean's daughter. Okay, wow. So I think she was born in like, um, I think it's Elizabeth McLean, mm -hmm. just one of the McLean daughters. I think she was born in 1868 um, or 1869, and she ended up donating to us in the 1940s. Okay. So we got that right. sign from the guy's daughter. That's incredible. Yeah, a lot of our collection has come from close relatives yeah, of the, the people who were witnesses. This, the cannonball yeah. and the Sherfy cherry tree came from Sherfy's granddaughter. Right, yeah, that's just incredible. Um, next question, is there a consensus about whether the shot that killed Jenny Wade was Union or Confederate? Oh, there's a consensus that it was Confederate. That makes sense. Um, yeah. The first account in the Gettysburg newspaper describing it um, says it was a Union bullet, a stray bullet from Union soldiers. But she was killed on July 3rd, and there were no Union soldiers firing from the edge of town back up towards the hill. It definitely came from the Southerners. Where exactly, you know, we debate about it. And we were just talking the other day, there was a forensic examination yeah. of the bullet hole uh, yeah. done by, I think, a professor. Is it, was it at West Virginia University? Uh, West Virginia and, University. And uh, they, they concluded that the shot most likely came from somewhere near the Rupp Tannery, where the Rupp House is yeah. located. Or the, or the area of the Farnsworth House, right in that area. Sure. Definitely it came from came in low, the west right? side yep. of Baltimore Street, mm -hmm. and it was slightly rising. And it, yeah, it came in low, so that's what yeah. the kind of, the, the story that it came from the attic of the Farnsworth House might not hold up with that, it's but st it's, still, it's tough to, you know, yeah, it is it's, tough it's to, in the area. to totally determine that. Yeah. Um, this question, do you know when the Little Round Top restoration will be complete? Last I heard, it was going to be uh, mid-next year, 2024, and they're hoping well, to... Well, they said 18 months when yeah. they closed. So that would probably put it in mid-2024. Uh, I think the goal was to have it open by the anniversary next year. But we did get a... We were given a, a preview um, a couple months ago and really enjoyed talking with the park and, and walking around and seeing the, some of the new trails. So. I refuse to go until it's open. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you, you'll be very pleasantly surprised when okay. it's done. Okay. Um, John Burns and others have made disparaging comments about Jenny Wade's morals and character. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any insights on this? Well, I would Good say question. that there's a, a few insights I have on it. And I would say that, you know, and believe me, uh, I'm not necessarily a feminist, but... <laughs> there is definitely a mindset to disparage women's role in the Civil War. And uh, you get that uh, from, you know, there's other girls, like there was a um, Mary Witherow, who uh, his, her mother had died, and she had to work for a living to help support her father and the family. And she's a nurse after the battle, and there's disparaging remarks about her, and she says, well, you know, 
I was a girl who worked. It's just not not thought well of. And of course, huh. Jenny Wade's, you know, uh, father is in the insane asylum, the almshouse, and and you know she's working. And um, sure, and they were um, poor. They were very poor. Yeah, and 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 you know, there's this idea that what did you know what. You know what was Jenny Wade doing anyway? You know she was. Yeah, you she, know, she. She wasn't was, fighting. She was baking bread for the soldiers. There's definitely more to it than just the fact that people suggest. You know, there's the reason why she's criticized, and um, it happens too. Um, it, it happens a lot. It's interesting to think about Jenny Wade being disparaged, though. Um, it's almost as if it's a backlash by the local people who are being disrespected in a general sense. You know, after the battle, there's a lot of negativity about how the town of Gettysburg wasn't doing as much as they could for the uh, wounded soldiers, which is ridiculous. But um, uh, when people come to town, they kept asking, you know, what about that Jenny Wade? Mm -hmm. What about that John Burns? Right. And people were like, um, excuse me, do you know I had 60 wounded in my house? Do you know that we cared for 20,000 wounded soldiers and they're everywhere and every one of us cared for soldiers? And you're asking, and people keep asking about Jenny Wade because, and they're like, well, she got accidentally killed. What are, you, what are you talking about? And of course, John Burns, he did not enjoy sharing the limelight with the other Gettysburg citizens, whether he disparaged <laughs> Jenny Wade or, you know, whether he's in his lectures in Philadelphia, you know, telling people that, while the cowards of Gettysburg are hiding in their basements, <laughs> you know, I was out fighting for my country. So, you know, John That's Burns great. is not a good source for uh, the disparaging of Jenny Wade. But I have account after account after account. But I, here's what I like in it, too, my personal insight. Don't be asking me about Joshua Chairman because I'm not going to say anything good about him. And it's not Joshua Chairman's fault that I don't like him. I don't like Joshua Chairman because I'm sick and tired of people not asking about the other 499 colonels in the battle. Why do they only want to know about that one guy? Because they watch the movie too much. <laughs> no offense to anyone who, who likes the movie Gettysburg, <laughs> hey, especially. I've watched the movie more than anybody. Yeah, though. I'm sure you have. But, yep, um, yep. Um, you know, so I understand <laughs> that, you know, people constantly asking you about the same thing over and over again and not understanding the scope of how many people were involved in the battle probably just irritated the Gettysburg citizens, and unfortunately, they took it out on poor Jenny Wade. Right. Well, you have quite a sympathy for Jenny Wade. We all know. Tim knows more about Jenny Wade probably than any living person. Um, so I'm going to take a, a quick break from asking you questions, and I just want to mention a few events that we have this weekend. If anybody's in the area, we would love to see you. Uh, it is Labor Day weekend. We have quite a few things going on. Uh, on Saturday at 10 a.m. in this room, we're doing a program called Excavating the Jack Hopkins House at Gettysburg College with uh, the college archaeologist, Ben Lully, who's a really good friend of ours. And I'm really excited for this program because last year uh, they did extensive work excavating property on the college uh, the college's land right behind Pennsylvania Hall, uh, where they discovered the foundation of the janitor's residence where Jack Hopkins, the college janitor, lived during the Civil War. And they found, I, I remember I was out there one day, they found art, pieces of you know artillery shells, they found bullets, they found all kinds of things related to the, the house and uh, the family that lived there, the Hopkins family who were free black residents um, of the Adams County. So I hope you'll, you'll come out for that if you can. That program um, I believe is free. I'm almost positive it's, it's uh, free. I think everything that week, this coming weekend is free. Uh, that's 10 a.m. on Saturday. Um, and then at 1 o'clock, Tim's doing a free program, Debris of Battle, about the aftermath and the cleanup and recovery effort after the battle, which is one of our favorite programs that we give semi-regularly. Uh, and then at uh, 2 o'clock, we have our friend Tom McMillan, who's going to talk about his book, Gettysburg Rebels, which is a fascinating look at the Confederate soldiers to come out of Gettysburg, most particularly Wesley Culp. Um, Tom's a, a great guy. He's going to be signing his books here after that program at 3 o'clock p.m. So that's Saturday. Um, and uh, we also have on Saturday an opportunity to fire our cannon. We have a, a reproduction Civil War cannon sitting outside in front of our building here that was donated very generously to us. Uh, just a few months ago, and we have uh, we've been working with the North South Skirmish Association, some of our friends who do this regularly, and we'll be firing the cannon. Um, it's sort of a, a fundraiser for the Historical Society. We love doing it. People seem to really enjoy it too. We we give them a little uh, intro to to you know what what it's 
what it takes to fire the cannon, all the procedures and the steps, and then you actually get to pull the uh, the lanyard and fire the cannon. We have free earplugs if you want to wear earplugs, and uh, you can find that information on our website. We still have a few slots available, although I think it's only a few at this point because we can only fire the cannon so many times. We have to be good neighbors to all of the people who live around here, and uh, I think we might not get any uh, business from them uh, in our museum if we keep firing the cannon so regularly. So um, that's what's happening this weekend. Uh, and then Thursday, September 7th. Um, oh, and Sunday. Actually, I don't, for some reason, I don't have Sunday on here, but you're giving a program on Sunday, right? I, th I think I'm doing John Burns on Sunday. Yeah, I think that's right, too. That, that's not, for some reason, on our sheet here, but I, that's right. Tim does have another free program on Sunday at 1 o'clock or at 11. Um, the September 3rd. Yeah. I think it's at 1 o'clock. We should know that. Yeah. But there's so many <laughs> programs, and for some reason, um, it's, that one is not listed here. Maybe, uh, maybe they're, you know, you're outshining everybody. Pretty sure it's 1 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and then Thursday next week, September 7th, uh, we have a research seminar with Tim, uh, Searching Historic Newspapers. I think there's only a few tickets available to that, but Tim's going to walk you through how we do historical research using um, his newspapers of the period. Um, and I really have enjoyed working with Tim on that program in the past. And then on September 9th, Saturday, a week from uh, this weekend, Tim is leading a walking tour of McAllister's Mill, which is, we've never done this before. Uh, it is a well-documented underground railroad site just south of Gettysburg on the Baltimore Pike near the old uh, Mulligan McDuffer golf course. And uh, so we are really excited to, uh, uh, to have you come out for that. It's a very limited number of, of people because there's not a whole lot of parking there. Uh, but we hope you'll come out and see that. There's tickets for that on our website. And uh, I think I'll stop there. And at, at some point, I'll promote a few of the, the programs in later September just so you have a sense of what's coming up. But uh, we also have a donate button on the post tonight. If you want to support what we're doing here, all of our education and preservation efforts in our new museum, Beyond the Battle, we'd certainly appreciate if you press the donate button on the, on the bottom of the video tonight. It's the little heart-shaped button. So um, I will get back to all the questions we've been getting now because we have, I think, 10 or 15 more questions that have come in while I was doing my I little think, I think it's great too, of course, um, you know, school started back up and we'll start slowly to get uh, school groups for our educational programs. And, you know, on a regular basis we do, um, a, there's a, a small series of programs we do that school kids come and they can, we offer to them like um, debris of battle where they can hold, uh, you know, a artillery shell or, um, you know, actually see a 69 caliber mini ball. And we've had a lot of fun. All the local school kids get free admission to everything and all of our programs. So we've had a lot of, a lot of them come through. I think more than 2,000 local students have already been uh, through the museum. And uh, it's just wonderful to see them here. Yeah, they, it was wild to have the entire eighth grade of Gettysburg <laughs> Middle School here. Yeah, we had them all in this room. Yeah. Like 250 of them or something. But uh, that, that would push the room to its limits. But they, they were fun. Um, okay, so I'm going to get back to the questions because that's what everybody wants. I know um, we, uh, we haven't done this in a while, so people have probably been saving up their questions. So um, a couple of these you could probably answer quickly. Someone wants to know about the volunteer units. Um, this person has an ancestor on the Pennsylvania Monument. I guess the question is about the distinction between volunteer units and regular well, army. Well, you know, um, really all the units that fought in the Battle of Gettysburg are volunteer units. So, uh, the, you know, when they say Pennsylvania volunteers, so they're, they're people who actually, you know, voluntarily went to a muster in uh, place and joined the army. Now, uh, none are at the Battle of Gettysburg, but there were Pennsylvania drafted militia units that had been, had gone into service and um, they were drafted in October of 1862 and uh, like the 165th Pennsylvania drafted militia um, was not with the Army of the Potomac. They were stationed near Suffolk, Virginia, um, not far from Norfolk. And um, there were about 800 men from Adams County in that unit. So, and after the Battle of Gettysburg, of course, they have a national draft. And, you know, in late July 1863, they have the draft riots in New York City or mid-July in uh, 1863. Um, so... There are drafted units, but early on when they drafted men, they tried to put the drafted units into fortifications or places where, you know, they um, wouldn't, there was, a, there was a, a thought that the drafted men would not fight as hard as the volunteer units. So they 
were careful about how they used them. Now later in the war, drafted units were thrown right into the, you know, fighting at Petersburg. But there is a distinction. Now in the Confederate Army, because we get asked this a lot, in the Southern Army, men joined. So I should say in the Northern Army, let's say at the beginning of the war, there's, you know, you join for 90 days and then there's other units that are mustered in for a year of service or two years. And when that term of service is done, you go home. But in um, the Confederate Army, these men joined at the beginning of the war for a short term of service, but then, because of the way things were going, the southern, most of the southern units, they just did away with the term, that, and you just were in for the war. So you could argue that southern soldiers, you know, they don't really have a choice. They're, they join the unit, they're in the unit, and they don't get to go home. They're, they're just, you know, huh. um, wow. their term is lengthened. Uh, yeah, for the most part. I don't think I realized that. That sort of dovetails into the next question, a very good question. Um, something I've never really thought about. Why are there no Confederate regimental flank markers on the battlefield? So, of course, there okay, aren't Confederate well, monuments I was gonna say, so much um, later, right? We only it's, have 20 monuments on the entire battlefield placed by Southerners. Right. You know, the thousand, you know, however many you want to count, you know, mon monuments, markers, and tablets, you could count 1,500, I guess, but only 20 of them were erected by Southern units. And um, how many southern regimental monuments four or are five, there? Maybe, maybe four or five. Is yeah, maybe. and um, uh, the, uh, the, se the you know, second Maryland Confederates mm -hmm. on Culp's Hill, they have an advanced position marker, mm -hmm. and that's almost like a flank marker. 11th Mississippi, 26th North Carolina. Yeah. What's that North Carolina unit at Culp's Hill? 43rd yeah. North Carolina. So there's, is there and any? then there's a 4th Alabama infantry oh, yeah, right. on the yeah. Confederate lines of battle. So, you know, um, most of the Southern memorials are state memorials, mm -hmm. and they don't have flank markers. Right. And there's just, you know, <clears throat> there's, uh, there's just not that many to There's not be enough to warrant that. it. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good, very good. Um, this one, answer quick, because we've got so many questions. What's your favorite day of the battle? I think I know July 1st. July 1st, where yeah. we're sitting, looking on, yeah, we are looking I, at Barlow's Knoll. I can see I Barlow's just, statue. Yeah. If I, if I ever get serious and write a book on the battle, I'll write a book about July 1st. I That's love great. the July 1st battle. Yeah. Was that always true? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, even though I wrote a book about Devil's Den and I like Devil's <laughs> yeah, Den, <right. laughs> I really like the first day's battle. You like an untold story, and the first day That's is probably right. the, the biggest right. of the untold stories. How many civilian casualties happened after the battle? Good question. Well, you know, I usually say there's about 30 civilian casualties. It, it depends on what you want to count after the battle. Obviously, there were a number of children that were killed after the battle because of unexploded ordnance or, you know, um, uh, you know, kids accidentally firing a rifle and killing another kid. Um, so, and then there are injuries, you know, not killed, but injuries. Um, and then there's a number of, um, well, you did say civilian casualties. So let's say there's like 10 really well-documented um, civilian casualties because of the unexploded ordinance and stuff. And that includes the guy whose little brother shoots him with a rifle he picked up. And the little girl in town is killed by a little, uh, you know, right. unnamed girl that's killed in town by a boy that's shooting a rifle. And then, um, then there's a number of civilians that die of disease. Sure. Specifically, you know, because they were drinking bad right. water, and it's hard to quantify. That's I right. Mean, it's have, hard to quantify. We've something looked like at that. we have uh, burial certificates or burial permits yes, from, from Evergreen Cemetery. Yeah, Evergreen Cemetery, and that's sort of how we know about some of these. But yeah. there are not a lot of yeah. other cemeteries, or you know, right. there's no death certificate at the time officially in the in Gettysburg. The, the state doesn't use them until after 1900, really. Bobby so, Bobby yeah. Hughes who. <laughs> Hoosh. Bobby Hoosh, <laughs> who did Gettysburg Daily, and you can still find this online, Gettysburg Daily. He did a post on this, and he examined, like, deaths in Gettysburg uh, from the newspapers and from the burial permits prior to the battle and afterwards and figured out there was a huge influx of, yeah. of death in Absolutely. the area. Disease, you know, deaths by disease early on after the battle. Sure. Great question. Another really uh, excellent question. Um, I'm very curious to see what you say. Who should get more coverage when we discuss the battle that doesn't? Could be a civilian, soldier, or anyone. Who do you think should be talked about more that is not currently being talked about? An individual person? Yeah. 
That's it. Mm, that's I knew who one. shouldn't be talked about more. <laughs> but, uh, Chamberlain is getting a lot of uh, hate tonight, yeah. unfortunately. No, I wasn't even thinking of that. <laughs> but um, um, I, I would say General Meade. General Meade always seems to get shortchanged. And that's right. one of the reasons why I think people that are really interested in the battle or maybe appear to be over the top with General Meade um, because, you know, um, as Gelzo would say about me, he thinks I protest uh, too much. I just <laughs> protest too much because I, you know, talk so much about General Meade. But, you know, we tend to, you know, in the Southern Army, you know, they glorify Robert E. Lee. You know, why not glorify General Meade? I think the defenders, you know, the whole, you know, Union Army being the defender, the defenders don't get enough um, attention. The people like General Green on Corps Hill who construct a really good defensive position kind of get left out of it. We, you know, we love to talk about the people charging across an open field in a cannon fire, but we don't talk about the people who suffer less casualties because they're smarter. What about civilians? Do you think there's any stories that are kind oh, of... Oh, there's lots of civilian stories. You know, the same civilian stories get told over and over and over again. And, right, You right. know, it would be nice to spread out more of the civilian story. Sure, yeah. So, um, but you know, the civilians saved people's lives and cared for wounded and... Was some, it, uh, who was it? Was it Julia Jacobs who was standing in the doorway you know, risking her life trying yeah. to stop people from yeah. crossing through an intersection where the yeah. Confederates were shooting, yeah. you know, down the road? It is... Uh, That's on July 4th. Right. We have a lot of stories, I think, civilian heroism yeah. where they didn't have to do what they did yeah. and, and that their stories don't get talked yeah. about as much as, like you said, Jenny Waiter, John the, Burns. That's powers, a great the question. The Powers Girls, you know. Yes, of course. Saving love like the, 20 men lives Powers girls yeah very good um okay let me see what, what we have next here um how was company b of the 21st pennsylvania cavalry involved in the battle okay well i know you know this is a very confusing thing for people because on the baltimore pike um south of gettysburg there's a monument to the 21st pennsylvania cavalry and Company B of the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry is from Gettysburg. And um, uh, this unit, I tried to explain this to people when they come in, this unit was not, the 21st was not established until July 1863, and it was established um, near uh, Columbia, PA. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was not a unit during the, during the Battle of Gettysburg. But Company B that was from Gettysburg, ended up over there because I guess they were, uh, technically the unit was formed in Chambersburg, but um, the 21st. But Company B had been part of a, another unit called the uh, Adams County Cavalry. And they were formed on June 15th and June 16th by a local named Robert Bell. And they had actually been a militia unit in service in 1862 at the time of the Maryland campaign. And even at the outbreak of the war, they were a militia unit uh, by a guy who um, commanded the unit near Fairfield, a guy, Abram, Abraham Hill McCreary was their commander. And so this had been a unit that um, had been around in some capacity earlier, but during the invasion by the Confederate Army in June of 1863. Uh, Robert Bell went to Governor Curtin and said, hey, you know, I have this militia unit. Um, I'll form them. We'll bring them to Harrisburg. And Curtin said, no, keep them in Gettysburg. I'll send a mustering in officer there and we'll use them as scouts. And so uh, on June 30th, June 23rd, an officer from Harrisburg came down, mustered them in. They didn't even have uniforms and they scouted the area as the Southern Army was invading the Cumberland Valley. And uh, they were there on June 26th when the Southern Army came over the mountain, Juba Early, and came into Gettysburg. And that's when one of their members, uh, George Sando, was killed on the Baltimore Pike. And that's, there's a monument to the spot where he was killed. Right beside it, there's a regimental monument to the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry. But then they ended up on June 26 riding to Hanover. Some of them rode towards Hunterstown and went a different way. They ended up in York. They went to Wrightsville. They were at the bridge when the bridge was burned by federal authorities. And some of the 21st got captured in the Battle of Wrightsville. And then after the battle, 
Um, some of them came back to Gettysburg, a squad of them, and were actually uh, scouting for General Meade on uh, July 4th. Don't we like have a diary of somebody who yeah, was one a, of the scouts? We have a diary of a guy in the 20, you know, in the 21st. But still, again, but this time they weren't really the 21st. This time they were just the Adams County Cavalry. And after right. all this, they become. But, but they had no be formal the role in the battle. No, not in the battle. Right. But then they are scouting afterwards, some of them. But then what really is interesting is after they're mustered in as the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry, then somebody's like, hey, they're from Gettysburg, and they're sent back to Gettysburg, and they guard hospitals in and around the town. Because, you know, Confederate prisoners are in these hospitals, and as soon as they get better, then they're going to want to try to escape. So they're guarding the hospitals. And then they're here for the Gettysburg Address, and they're used as sort of a, um, a provost guard in the town during the Gettysburg Address. And that's how one of their members is guarding Abraham Lincoln's door. One of their members is at the corner of the building. One of the members is at the telegraph office. One of the members, remember, is um, helping uh, guard William uh, Seymour. Right. So they're... And we have a photograph of Lincoln's I bodyguard. I say William is Horatio Seymour, isn't it? Yeah, that's all right. No one would have caught that. Yeah, they would. <laughs> Everybody knows um, all the. Vi- let me. We got a lot of questions. Let me see. Well, I'll try to get them. Uh, someone's asking if we will do another all-day walking tour with Tim and Gary. The answer is yes. We have not released the tickets yet, but we are planning something very special on November seventeenth, I believe, Friday. I think I got that right. Uh, Tim and Gary are going to do a. Uh, road rally of sorts where you'll meet at various locations in the borough of Gettysburg following in the footsteps of Lincoln during his time in Gettysburg. So um, that'll start uh, near the train station, but tickets will become available very soon on our website. So look out for that. And and uh, when we send an email, um, please open it and read it because we're usually trying to get these things out. We have so many events. We just want to uh, spread the word as much as we can through our email. So if you're on our email list, you'll, you'll hear about that very, very soon. Um, and uh, okay, so the next question, I like this one. Were there dogs that would have been barking at the soldiers as they passed by in 1863 oh, wow. in Gettysburg? No, it, it coincidentally... Um, just, was it yesterday? Was it Monday? Monday, this very subject came up. And we do have this account. Um, I was just looking at it. I, I forget who it's by. It might be Samuel Bird, 13th Alabama Infantry. And he describes that they form line of battle um, out, uh, you know, a few companies are thrown out after the first shot of the battle near Willoughby's Run and Marsh Creek, I should say. And as they're marching across the fields, they come upon his house, and there's this vicious dog barking <laughs> at them. And, you know, this uh, old lady comes out, and one of the soldiers is like, you know, I've had enough of this, and shoots and kills the dog. Oh, my God. And um, Oh, you have that in your... You have Tim has a document of civilian casualties and of the I battle, the dog and the in, dog is in the... Uh, for the, the dog lovers casualties. watching, you'll love that. I remember reading it, and it just said unnamed dog or yeah. something. Um. <laughs> and the lady, the lady's really upset with the Southern soldiers for killing her dog and starts yelling at them. Wow. And uh, yeah, so one of the first casualties of the battle is a dog that was wow. killed. Wow. And I can tell you this, story. I don't know wow. about, Incredible. you know, specifically accounts of dogs because we don't have that many of them on the, mm-hmm. the farmer's dogs. But look into photographs. Lydia Leister's house, there's a dog house. Uh, Sherfy's house, um, there's a, you know, there's a dog house. Right. Uh, and uh, me, uh, General um, Lee's headquarters, you know, Mary Thompson, in that photograph, there's a dog house. Sure. And we know from early on, the citizens of Gettysburg, a lot of them have dogs, because we have dog licenses, yeah. and there's a dog tax. And so, of course, there were a lot of dogs. I don't know about cats. That wasn't asked, but uh, do okay. we know about cats? I don't think... Don't we, remember a cat. Not, we don't have a cat account yet. Um, okay. Someone is asking what kind of feedback we've been getting from visitors to our new facility. That is a very nice question. Yeah. Well... I, I actually am surprised by the high percentage of really positive comments. I mean, you know, I expected positive comments, but it's been overwhelmingly positive. We hardly ever get a negative comment. And if it's a negative comment, well, about one specific thing or small thing. So I think everybody's enjoying the museum. 
And uh, I think people are surprised at how nice the museum is. But we did put like three years of work into it, and we have been talking about it for right. a long time. I would say we were, I think, a little nervous about our immersive experience caught in the crossfire because it is very loud and intense, and it's sort of different than what you'd expect in a, a small, relatively small museum. But we've had really, really great feedback on that especially. So if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, we're open every day of the week, 10 to 5. Yep. Um, our members have free admission to the museum. You can be a member at f starting at $40 a year, but uh, the regular admissions anywhere from 10 to $15, depending on some of our discounts. So we hope you'll come out and if you haven't already and see the museum or come back because there's so much in there. It was like writing a book. I am sure you will see something you didn't see the first time if you come back again. And then um, we have all these programs. You know, we've been doing programs in our event center and people, you know, have people have loved the event center here. I'm glad now. you said that. <laughs> people, <laughs> I mean, you know, looking, a list. just sitting here and looking out the window, it's just, it's just great. It is and, amazing. Um, you you yeah. don't know how nice it is until you're in here doing a program. Yeah, just a beautiful view of Howard Avenue and Barlow's Knoll. Yeah. Um, we, we couldn't be happier with our new home. Thank so you for asking. So what programs do we have coming So up? yeah, another few programs I want to mention. I mentioned, I'll mention one more time on September 9th, a walking tour with Tim at McAllister's Mill, which is an underground railroad site. We've never done a tour there before, to my knowledge. Perhaps yeah. you have. Now, HGAC used to give walking. Well, they, they I think, think they still do. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, mostly in the spring, I think. Right. But um, uh, it's but I but I've never done it. I've been you know I've been going down there since I've been a kid, and we know the owners of the site. Yeah, it's, it's a really incredible owned. place. That's the other thing; it's privately owned, and we have permission to go down to the site and check right. it out. Yeah. So we hope you'll that's us. You'll join us. That's Saturday, September 9th at one p.m. Tickets are on our website. It's achs-pa.org.org, um, and then uh, the, the the next. Uh, slate of programs. On September 11th, we're doing a program Monday at 4 p.m. called Adams County Remembers World War II, which is a partnership with the Eisenhower National Historic Site. We're really, really pleased to be working with them on that. We're going to be talking about people's memories of, of uh, the Second World War, and uh, um, I think that's to coincide with some of the other World War II uh, themed programming around that time. Uh, then on September 14th, we have uh, a special program about the civilians of Antietam. Uh, we have an, the author of a book about the civilian accounts from the Battle of Antietam. I think I can say Tim and I were very impressed by the research this person has done, and, and uh, it's nice to see other sites paying attention to the civilian accounts. There's some fascinating stuff. So Absolutely. that's, that's uh, 7 p.m. on September 14th, Thursday night. And, the, you know, the Antietam, they just reopened their new That's museum right. yeah. at the National Military Park at Antietam. And I have some friends that work there, and it's just a, a fabulous museum. And then uh, the, the last thing I want to promote tonight, which we're really excited about, on September 15th, that's a Friday, uh, from 7 to 9 p.m., we are doing a live taping of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast here, which is a very popular show with Jim Hessler and Eric Lindblade, uh, and Tim is going to be joining them on stage to talk about all things Lincoln and Gettysburg. So um, if you want to learn all about Lincoln's visit, some of the obscure details, um, and, and how that relates to... Uh, um, to, to, to the Battle of Gettysburg and, and the establishment of the National Cemetery. Uh, that'll be at uh, 7 p.m. on Friday, September 15th, in this room, again, with the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, Jim and Eric, which is a, a great show. We're so happy they're, they're going to be taping it here. Uh, you can get tickets on our website for that as well. Um, so thank you for listening to, to all those program announcements. We, we have so much going on um, that it's, it's hard to even keep all of it in our head, but, but it is uh, really fun to and, see people coming uh, in and enjoying so, everything. Besides that, um, every Saturday and Sunday at one o'clock, when we're not doing a you know special program, we have a uh, program on some aspect of local history right. of the battle. And every Tim usually gives those. They're free. They're every weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, you can come in and, and see uh, uh, Tim's programs and ask him questions in person. Um, so we have a lot of other questions. We can get back to that. Uh, I know it's just a kind of an overwhelming amount of comments tonight, which is wonderful. Thank you for for being on the on the video. Uh, next question, was Dr. Rufus Weaver aware of any Confederate dead left buried on the Gettysburg battlefield after sending the remains of the 3,320 soldiers south? Yeah, I thought, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, somebody was in and, and um, boy, it's been a long time since I personally researched this subject. But, um, you know, I used to talk to Coco all the time about this great Coco who was really into the aftermath. I am pretty sure that there were sites on the battlefield that he never got to because 
you know, they stopped paying him or they didn't pay him right away when he shipped the body south. So he stopped, um, you know, reinterring the body. So I do believe and um, I want to say the area like south of the peach orchard, maybe he never got to. Um, uh, I forget exactly uh, what I'm thinking about. But um, besides that, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, they didn't recover all yeah. the bodies from even the looking field. at the numbers it, it's yeah, just, just looking at absolutely the uh i think a given that there are still a considerable amount of yeah burials. and that's why if you look through our local newspapers that's one good thing about uh, newspapers.com if you're researching um one of our good friends randy miller who's uh you know a part-time employee here at the adams county historical society he loves going into newspapers and looking for body found I think he's got a folder, and he, he must have, like, if you add them up, because sometimes it's like 10 or 12 found at one time. I think he's got, like, 150 Confederate bodies or, you know, bodies that were found on the battlefield from the time of the battle up until, like, the 1930s. And, of course, there's even one, you know, we know, the one found at the railroad cut in 1992. Yeah, 96, I believe. 96, okay. I just know that because that's the year I was Good. born. <laughs> um but uh, what, I don't know a month. I think it was before. It was definitely, mm -hmm. I was born in December, yeah. so it must have been before that. Another great question. How can our educational system better teach children more about the Civil War and its cause? Mm -hmm. Great. G great question. What are, you, what are your well, I, I, you know, top I, of I, mind I, thoughts for on me, that? You know, for <laughs> me, it was really weird because, uh, you know, um, I think just like I use the Battle of Gettysburg as a watershed, you know, point in our uh, county, um, a lot of school districts use it as a halfway point when they're teaching American history, I think. So uh, when I went to eighth grade, I remember we'd studied like up into the Civil War to Christmas, and we came back, we started after the Civil War, we never had Civil War in you know, my <laughs> eighth grade, which was disappointing for me. But, um, uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. There's so many aspects of history that are important, you know, and... Um, I tell you, what we try to do when I've worked with American Battlefield Trust on this is just make resources about the Civil War more available to teachers who right. are uh, engaged in that subject. And they've done a phenomenal job with that. And, you know, we pattern some of the things we do um, here locally because we're doing the same thing, but we're trying to get local history across to the teachers, um, you know, uh, let the students come here for free, uh, make resources available to the teachers that they can go on easily on your website and get resources. You know, that's, that's where it starts, I guess. Historical entities making it easier uh, for these uh, teachers to find information. Right. Yeah, I think I'll answer that one quickly, too. I think the, uh, the way that history is taught often feels like a chore in that it is sort of a memorization and recitation of facts. And facts are, you know, understanding historical facts are very important, but I think you have to, you have to love the story behind those facts. If there's not a good story, they're going to forget it. It's, you know, they learn it, they take their test, and then they forget it. I took a lot of classes like that where I, you know, I, I couldn't tell you the first thing about it. But I think everyone would probably agree that a good story, you, you never really forget it. And so I think that's why we're all drawn to history. We're drawn to the stories. It's all about storytelling. It's about, you know... Uh, the the excitement of, of discovering these things and research and and I think when it just becomes memorizing information then that's when we lose kids and they don't appreciate it so that, yeah. that's what I would say to that. I, I think also with Gettysburg is tying in a school trip to that activity so you know and um, when I was in eighth grade like I said we didn't really study uh, the Battle of Gettysburg but we had a school trip here you know, from Baltimore, we got on the bus and we came to Gettysburg and a tour guide gave us a tour of the battlefield. And I still remember that tour. So you remember any specific stories that were told on that tour? Like Sally, the dog. Or I, something? I do. Rem <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I just remember that the vultures are 120 oh, yeah. years yeah. old. <laughs> and that I remember that, uh, you know, I do remember <laughs> them getting across the point that Edward Everett spoke for two hours and no right. one knows what he said and no one can remember his name. And Lincoln spoke for two minutes and we memorized what he said. So I like that point in it. But um, 
uh, yeah, I don't remember. I just remember being excited about the battle, being excited about the battle. Right. So uh, that's and that, when I talked, I talked to tons of people, especially as a tour guide, seeing kids all the time and talking to uh, adults about the battlefield. And I think it's some of it. It's really it comes down to this: if you had a good history teacher and he made history exciting, you like history today. If you had a uh, teacher that wasn't so good and wasn't so exciting. You don't like history. Did you have a history teacher that really sticks I out did. to you? What was the person? I give a shout name? out to him, Mr. Duffy. Is he still with us? Uh, I, hate to say I have that. no idea. <laughs> Maybe Baltimore, he's watching. Baltimore, Baltimore County School System, Mr. Right. Duffy, and then of course Mr. Matthews. I should give a shout out to Mr. There Matthews. He's a good friend of mine. He's still alive from Westminster High. Now he's not teaching anymore, but he came here to visit me a few weeks ago. Mine was Mrs. Berkey, Mrs. Janet Berkey. And I, I know she's a member of the Historical Society, and I got to give her a tour. She was my fourth grade history, well, fourth grade teacher. And she did a lot of really great history. Um, and uh, she's, she's around in our community, and uh, I'm just so glad she could come in and see our museum. Okay, so lots of questions here, lots and lots of questions. I'm going to answer one quickly. Do we ever think that Sally Meyer's 1863 diary will be found? I do. I hope so. I mean, we really did hope, this person mentioned it, it's uh, Kathy, who we know, uh, great question. She asked if we thought we'd find it during the move, and uh, I was hoping it would turn up somewhere. Um, I don't want to tell a long story, but we have Sally Meyer's diaries from the Civil War, but the 1863 diary went missing, what, in the 1970s or 80s, like decades ago, yeah. and it, we have no idea where it is, and we're really hoping, if anyone knows where it is, please, you know, drop it off. We won't ask any questions. <laughs> we just want to have it back. <laughs> Um, There's been several times where stolen and stolen items have been returned come to, back us to us in yeah. recently, and right. um, we've never caused a never caused a fuss about it. Right. Ooh, good one. What was the price of the fine for racing down Racehorse Alley? You know that one. <laughs> I, do I don't not. know if we know the answer. Well, it's well, a funny I don't question. Know, I don't know. That seems a misnomer to me. I don't know if there was a. I don't know where they're getting. There's a fine for racing. Horses down racehorse alley. I don't know if I heard that. So one what happens yeah. is it's called, as I understand it, it's called racehorse alley because Colonel John McClellan owned racehorses and he owned the Hotel Gettysburg. And in the alley behind the hotel, near where the parking garage is today, he had a stable where he had all his race horses and he would race on the track. There was a track near Gettysburg. But every morning he would have, you know, a crew race the horses up and down the alley <laughs> for training purposes. That's incredible. And that's where I'm thinking it comes from. I don't think they're finding him. I think he's using racehorse alley it's to train his horses. Race, yeah. Racing up, up and down the alley. That's but I don't amazing. know if he's having races. There's actually, you know, um, a place outside of town. Start at least in 1867, right? They had the fairgrounds and he's racing them around there. Great question. Wow, I see a lot of, a lot. I'm trying to get through as many of them as I can. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if I want to even risk asking you this, but why yeah. did Meade take so long to pursue Lee after the battle? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, Tim's a big defender of Meade, so don't take uh, this personally. I don't know. They moved on July 5th. Uh, I, I, I don't know. When people see questions, I don't know where, where they're getting their information from. Right, right. That is sort of a... You know, a, a, I think, a hotly debated point, though. I think a lot of people believe that Meade was not fast enough. But yeah. well, you know, let me ask you this: How come you know? Would, how come Grant and Force Lee to surrender at the Battle of Wilderness? How come right. it took them a whole yeah. another year or whatever? Right. Yeah. There are a lot of you yeah. know. You, you look back on. You can easily look back on yeah. things. How about and, uh, this? How about, how about Meade <laughs> couldn't move very quickly because he lost more men than any other American army had ever lost at any battle in any war in American history. That is the perfect answer to that question. If anyone asks that, uh, if you hear that question asked, you should play that clip of Tim answering it with that. Wonderful. Um, most underrated part of the Gettysburg battlefield, both historically and for visiting? Well, it'll probably Culp's Hill. Yeah, right. Because, yep. because it's not on the main tour route of the battlefield. I agree. And sometimes is looked at as an afterthought. Yeah. So that's sure. for Charlie Fennell. He would, he would want me to say that. I would say, too, like the Gettysburg Address in general. Like it yeah. seems to me that that's sort of an afterthought well, you know, for a lot of people. One thing I, I, I worried about, and, and of course I'm sure it's true, even when the visitor center, National Park Service Visitor Center, was across the street from the entrance to the cemetery, the cemetery got low visitation. And wow. now that the visitor center is a totally different location, 
and you have to drive there and stop and then walk up to the top of the hill and go in, hardly anybody goes into the Why do you think that cemetery. is? Do you think it's just because the site is not so prominently marked that like this is where the Gettysburg Address happened? There really isn't any, yeah, yeah, any monument or yeah. marker. At, yeah. You know. Yeah. But it is it's interesting to me. It always you yeah. know, the greatest speech perhaps in world history, if not yeah. American. Now with history. foreign visitors, I can tell you if a group comes from like Germany or France or you know, if you get a Canadians, every foreign visitor wants to see the site of the Gettysburg Address. That's their main reason to come here. This is a specific one, but do you know anything about Tilly Pierce's children or siblings? This person um, um, li lives near her grave in yeah, I don't think, Grove. I don't think she has any children, does she? Boy. I don't know. But yeah. um, I don't think so. But her brother, you know, she got some brothers. So, um, and, um, Where did the first Pennsylvania Reserves fight when they came back to Gettysburg in the Valley of Death, the base yeah, of Little Round they Top? Yeah, the, they were part of Crawford's division, so they charged down from Little Round Top across the Valley of Death, and they positioned themselves at the stone wall on the east side of the wheat field. Really good questions. Are there any Confederate breastworks visible by the Spangler House? Confederate breastworks near the I think Spangler maybe House. maybe the Spangler Farm on the... Uh, because here's the Federal problem Avenue? with that question. There's a whole bunch of different Spanglers. That's a good, yeah. Maybe this person could clarify which Spangler, and then we'll, they might, we'll they try might, to answer that yeah, they're, um, more specifically. Maybe they're talking about, you know, where the Virginia Memorial is, right behind it, there's a little bit yeah, of I would imagine. Uh, Confederate yeah. breastworks there in the woods there. But Pickett's, if they're referring to the Spangler, Henry Spangler Farm, Pickett's division doesn't have any breastworks. They, they're just there. And Here's a good decision. one. I really like this. What personal tale from the battle tugs at your heartstrings the most? <laughs> what was I just telling? I was just talking about Sally the War Dog the other day, and I got a little emotional. Um, maybe Armistead, you know, you know I, I, Armistead dying, you know. That's um, good. I thought we'd get back to Jenny Wade again, because, of course. Yeah, I guess much... I tell the Jenny Wade story so much, you yeah, know. Yeah, right. But, um. That's a really good question. Oh my gosh. I think we're all probably uh, biased toward the things that we've really looked yeah. into a lot, but there are so many stories. Yeah. That, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure the, the, the stories that tug at my heartstrings most are the ones I tell in the National Cemetery, because of course they're all going to have a bad ending, because they're yeah. in the cemetery. I was on a tour with them with some, um, it was the interge intergenerational elder hostel. And uh, it was grandparents and grandchildren. And I took them on a tour of the cemetery. And of course, these kids, they're like, you know, 10, 11, 12. And they never like toured a cemetery before. And I'm telling all these stories. And one of the kids is like, Mr. Smith, your stories are all so sad. Because <laughs> you're in a cemetery, you know? But, you know, speaking of that, Humiston. Yeah, there's Humiston's a, a great. There's a story oh in the gosh. first day's battle. Maurice Buckingham. Have you heard me do my Maurice Buckingham I don't think thing? So. Oh my God, he's in um, the hundred and um, is it the boy? I tell it. I don't even remember the hundred fourth. Hundred fourth Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. or, I'm sorry, hundred fourth New York. He's from Geneseo, New York, and he's wounded in the first day's fighting. He's taken to the Christ Lutheran Church. His leg is amputated. Uh, a nurse comes to him and is looking at his leg and says, you know. You're doing good. You're, you're probably going to survive. And every day she goes to him and he's just sad. And she's like, well, why are you so upset? You're, you're, you're making it. You're going to live. And he says that he had just become engaged to like the most beautiful girl in Geneseo, New York. Oh. And when she finds out that he lost his leg and he's not going to have the ability to provide for her, she's going to break up with him. Oh so gosh. the nurse sits down with him and writes a letter home to this girl. And then a couple weeks later, you know, um, she goes over to his cot, and he's really upset, and he has a letter. And she picks it up and reads the letter, and it basically, Dear Maurice, I hope you understand oh that this gosh. means we can never be together. Oh, my God. And he died the next day. <laughs> And that's all proven, like that is a real story. Yeah, it's from um, Patriotic Daughters of Lancaster. Wow. Um, I've never heard that before. Yeah. Well, in the story, she doesn't tell the guy's name, but she gives a whole bunch of clues to who it is. And then I, you know, it's a long story, but I have a, written, wow. wrote an article about it. He's buried in the New York section of the Soldiers National Cemetery. Wow. So I think, you, you know, I think there's a lot of stories you can make people cry if you really wanted to. Wow. I had to be careful one tour. I had this lady, she kept crying. Every time I tell a story, she would cry. Right. Loudly. 
So I didn't want to tell any sad stories. That's, <laughs> that's great. I'm trying to get as many of these as I can. But sometimes, you know, you can cry because you're sad. Sometimes it's just emotional. You know, it's an uplifting story. Sure. So... I would say Sally Myers, every time we read her stuff, it's just incredible. Yeah. The way, how candid she is. A lot of people, you know, there's the, the prose of the 19th century is very kind of dense and, 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 you know, unemotional. And then you have Sally Myers' diary where she just says these statements that just hit you so hard. Like when she walks into St. Francis Church and she sees, you know, the soldier dying right inside the door. And, you know, he says, you know, I, I'm beyond being helped. And she says, I walked outside and I cried. You know, like she's writing this in her diary, so she's not writing it for public consumption. It's really amazing when you when you get that kind of the the emotion from these people when they're not writing it, you know, for the newspaper. Um, okay, who is the, uh, in your opinion, the unsung hero of Gettysburg? <laughs> Un unsung. Well, again, you know, nobody Meade. talks about General Meade. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on, he's a commander. He did of the win Northern the battle. Army. He, he did, did win, win the, the battle, battle, and you just don't Very hear anything good. about him. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of, I'd say the unsung hero is the person you don't know anything about that really contributed to the battle. And, it, and sure. here's the other thing about that. Like, um, before we're talking about, you know, it, read just one of the units, the, all the regiments are in the battle. Just read about one of them. It doesn't matter which one. And each one of them has a story to tell. Right. I can answer this one. Who built the Dobbin House? It was the Reverend Alexander Dobbin in 1776. It was completed in, yeah. in uh, 1776. Now, there was a wooden structure there prior to that on that farm, and it was owned by um, William Bones and then a guy named John Carson. And then Dobbin had bought the property in 1774 and it had a log house on it. And then in 1776, built the Dobbin House. And I'm glad that person asked because the Dobbin House is one of our biggest supporters. Hope you'll, yeah. you'll go out and enjoy a meal at the Dobbin House. It's one of our favorite places yeah. in town. Um, okay, let's see. We've got plenty more questions here. Was the Wills House used as a hospital? If so, would Lincoln have seen the after effects of a home used as a hospital when he stayed there in November of 1863? I think they had it pretty much you know, cleaned up by then. But yes, in weeks after the battle, there were several accounts of wounded soldiers being treated there in the house. I think uh, Francis Barlow was there for a while. And some Confederates too, right? Because we have yeah, in our museum right. downstairs in the museum, we have a painting given to the Wills family by a Confederate soldier who I guess his wife had painted it. He had been treated in the house as yeah. a wounded soldier after the but battle. But what we should mention is that when we call something a hospital, well, Coco and I, Greg Coco and I talked about this a lot. He wrote a book called A Vast Sea of Misery about the hospitals around the town. When we say hospital, we're talking about one wounded soldier being in a building. So, you know, I always, in my mind, I differentiate between like a hospital, like there are 100 patients and there's doctors and nurses, and like families are caring for individual wounded soldiers, like two or three or four or five or six. You know, that's a different scenario, but there are wounded everywhere. Right. I want to thank. Timothy York, our good friend, for donating. Oh. That's very nice. Uh, thank you. Again, you can hit that, uh, that the heart-shaped button on the post mm -hmm. if you want to donate and help us with supporting all of our programs and, mm -hmm. and the million artifacts we have right behind this wall that constantly need our attention to keep uh, preserved. Um, okay, Peter is asking, Tim, did you know Ed Bars? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. Actually, and if you read uh, Ed Bars' um, uh, I forget the name of the book, but he's wrote a book about Civil War battlefields, mm -hmm. and I'm one of the uh, editors of oh, the book. Oh, that's great. I edited the Gettysburg I never got to meet him. 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 I really regret not being able to meet him, but he was a member of the Historical Society, mm -hmm. and I remember signing mm -hmm. uh, his, his membership mm -hmm. letters and that kind of thing. Gary and I did tours with Ed Bars. He was a so, great guy. you know, as he got older, he couldn't always be the main tour guide because, you know, he was getting older. And so a couple times, and that's great. Gary and I... I love his book on the Battle of Monocacy. If you haven't read mm -hmm. that, it's one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's see. What else do we have here? Somebody says, hey, Uncle Christine Cridland. Is that, do you have a, a, a niece? I don't know. Who? Somebody says, hey, Uncle Christine. <laughs> Maybe you have a niece you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> my niece is like 12, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not her. Um, I'm trying to think of which did, it is. Did Robert E. Lee, yeah, you'll get in trouble for that later. Uh, did Robert E. Lee have current maps of the Gettysburg area? Ooh, well, good, you know, good question. Um, basically what had happened is 
uh, you know, prior to the Gettysburg campaign, scouts were sent up into the area, uh, spies, and they did purchase county maps. So they uh, had the 1858 Adams County wall map, uh, they had the Cumberland County wall map, the York County wall map, and you probably, people who know about this probably already know this, Jedediah Hotchkiss made maps of this area based on these county maps. And some people came up here and uh, scouted out the mountain range so they could put topographical features on this base map. And I think the original Hotchkiss base map for the Confederate invasion uh, is at the Hanley Library in Winchester, Virginia. Wow. And the, uh, we have several copies of, maybe a handful of copies of the original wall map, yeah. 1858 wall map. Yeah. And you can tell me if this story is, is complete crap, but um, is it true that Jubal Early walked into a tavern and, and oh, took yeah. out his knife and carved out the Gettysburg section of the 1858 map off the wall in the yeah. tavern to take with him? Yep, in Cashtown, the Widow Brooks Tavern. That's great. In Hilltown. I know, love that it's story. It's going to be specific in Hilltown. When was the last hospital finally closed after the battle? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on, again, how you figure things like that, but it was in early November, you know, just before Lincoln came for the Gettysburg Address, that Camp Letterman General Hospital finally transported the last of their patients to a major hospital. They've transported them to Harrisburg and Philadelphia and other areas, but just in November. So for four months, the town was just, you know, wounded soldiers were left here. It's incredible, yeah. Um, are you still actively looking for the location of the Harvest of Death photo location, or have you pretty much exhausted all of the possibilities? Well, that's that's Tim, Timothy York asking, oh, by the way. Yeah. I, I don't know if I've exhausted all the possibilities, <laughs> but I don't look as much. Definitely, I don't look as much, no. It's, I, it's depressing. I, I look sometimes. I always say that, you know, you know when I, well, I mean, for 35 years, I was a tour guide, and every day I'm riding around the battlefield. Do you think I'm listening myself give a tour, or do you think I'm driving around <laughs> looking for harvest of death sites? I say, I don't, think, I don't think people understand the amount of hours I spend looking for it. The other problem with it is there's nothing in the photograph that even if we find it, we're going to be able to say, oh, that's it. There's right. no rock. Right. That's what my argument is for everyone listening, is that yeah. no one will ever say that this is it like no one of authority yeah. is ever going to say you've got it because there's nothing that yeah. would hold up over time there's no rock there's yeah. there's you know, not a building in it there's absolutely nothing in those photos so. that you could look at it and say this is 100 yeah. percent it so. yeah I, I personally am like the master of f having a photograph with a rock in it and finding that rock but there's no rocks in that photograph, so. Right, so it will probably, I'm gonna say, I'll go out on a limb and say it will never be definitively located, but you know, maybe that's maybe uh, too pessimistic. We, I have my, my theories, but, but uh, Tim has very little patience for anyone's theories. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because people keep asking me about it. And I, and oh, they, sure. They should yeah, know right. that I don't have much you know, right, tol right. tolerance for I think Tim is being tired. He's now tired of being asked about it, so I hate to say that, <laughs> but uh, we've just had so many people propose theories and you know it's uh um you know we uh we will probably never know the answer to the yeah. question thank you for all the pause people are giving really nice comments about the museum and that means a lot to us because we did work very hard and if you really enjoy listening to tim that museum i will say is like one of his i mean that's his book really tim wrote our museum i helped with the editing and you know picking out photos and but that is you know if you really want to to read another tim smith book his latest book is in museum format, just yeah. below our feet downstairs, 5,000 square feet. You can feet. imagine my voice as you go around. Maybe we should do that, put me reading the text <laughs> on tape or something. That would be great. Actually, we could do an audio book of the museum. I love that idea. Um, okay, let's see. We've got still a lot of questions. We're going to try to answer them um, in the last few minutes here. Let's see. Will we partner with other local historical societies to highlight other Adams County history? We have in the past, and we certainly love doing that, especially I think New Oxford we've worked with and done some tours with them. Uh, but there are all kinds of really great histories of the towns around Gettysburg. And, uh, of course, our archives has records from all these towns, so we have a lot of people come in and do research um, on Hunterstown or, yeah. or Fairfield or Littlestown or Biglerville. And if you visit Gettysburg, I'm going to make a plug for this is – the Adams County is so beautiful. If you drive just 10, 15 minutes due north of Gettysburg, past our building, if you've never done it, I'm just amazed at how many people who visit here haven't done it before, yeah. but we have beautiful orchards and fruit markets, and if you like apples and pears and, 
and, and peaches, and, and every season you come here, there's something new. One of our uh, good friends, Holobaz, uh, they've mm-hmm. been very supportive of the Historical Society, and I've been going there since I was a kid. That is just like 10 minutes north yeah. of here, if that, on the other side of Biglerville. So next time you're here, if you have an extra few hours, I highly recommend exploring the rest of the county. And the Apple Harvest Festival is coming up here in That's October, right. which is a big, big event in our uh, county's agricultural area. Yep. But um, also, I was going to mention, uh, last Saturday, I think it was, Carroll County um, Genealogical Society came. So nearby counties, you know, they send people to visit, and we share and learn about history. And Andrew and I just were at the Chester County Historical we Society. We did, yeah. We went on our little research trip. We found some things. We'll probably be in talking about mm-hmm. that more mm-hmm. uh, soon. Um, great comments. Can you use Fold3 and newspapers.com at our research room without a subscription? Yes. Yes, you can. You can come in anytime. We have access to all of that and, and ancestry.com as well. Someone's asking about my new kitten. Thank you. That's, that's nice. I guess they saw wow. that on online. I did get a new kitten and uh, there's a story behind that that's too long to tell right now. Uh, okay. Would Lee have had better concert of action, that's in quotes, if he had, 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 if he had held councils of war with all of his main subordinates? Yeah. Here's a good question. Of course, yeah. uh, Lee doesn't like to have councils of war. Right. Napoleon <laughs> never had councils of war. <laughs> Napoleon, would he say something like, councils of war never fight? Oh, I like this question a lot. I have heard this somewhere. Is it true that Lee always had a chicken named Nellie for fresh eggs throughout the entire war? I think that comes from like a story that was told at the dedication of the Virginia Memorial. Okay. I think it's in the newspaper. Ed Guy would tell that. He's a tour guide. He would tell that story all the time. So we had to ask him where it comes from. Jerry Hoffman is correcting us, which I really appreciate. Tilly Pierce did have children, oh. Harry, Anna, and Mary Alleman. So yes, we, we have perhaps we need to brush up on Tilly Pierce's yeah. genealogy. Uh, yeah, yeah. She is the face of yeah. our museum logo too, yeah, so we should definitely know that. I don't know that. that. Good. Um, this is more of a technical question. Um, oh, but we should preface it by saying we should say she did move away. Yes. So, so you we, know. we don't know as much about yeah. her after Gettysburg yeah, her, years. Yeah. They, yeah. When did uh, when the Confederates were around Table Rock Road. What was their objective up there? This is before the battle. I assume it's about the oh, skirmish. Oh, I think, um, no, Table Rock Road's a road right up here. Well, I think, um, you know, the Southern Army came in from that direction. You know, okay, right. um, uh, Rhodes Division came from Biglerville down Route 34. And there's always been some discussion about whether they may have used Table Rock Road also as they came down towards the area. But throughout the battle on July second and third, there were roving detachments of Confederate cavalry that were raiding behind the Confederate lines, gathering supplies and provisions. And the mill in downtown Table Rock was hit by uh, Confederate soldiers, and it took all the grain out of the mill. So while the main battle is going on, there are detachments going around to all the farms and gathering stuff up. That's probably what that's referring to. Very good. Okay, I think we're going to do one more question. We've got a, a good one to end on. Matt is asking, how important was the cavalry part of the battle on July 3rd? Tell us more about East Cavalry wow. Field. This is a great last question. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, um, t- the other day there was a guy at the desk, and um, um, I got called down, and there was this guy, and he said, you know, how come they don't interpret East Cavalry Field more? How come it doesn't get the credit it deserves? And, you know, after talking to him for a few minutes, I realized that, the book he had read on the battle was by, um, I think his name's Thomas Carhart, and it was Lee's Real Battle Plan. <laughs> and in that book, it was about how Lee was sending Jeb Stuart around behind the lines to attack the rear of Cemetery Ridge at the same time Pickett is attacking the front. And of course, the, according to that book, you know, uh, Custer's near Big Round Top, or riding towards Big Round Top, and Custer hears the sounds of the guns, turns his brigade around, goes back out to East Cavalry Field, leads a charge, st- personally stops Jeb Stuart, and saves the Northern Army during the war. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, there's so many ridiculous things uh, that, to this. There's very little or no evidence that Lee is sending Jeb Stuart around to attack Cemetery Ridge from the rear. At the same time, Pickett is attacking to the front. One of the reasons people believe that, well, there's a number of reasons, but that was actually stated as a fact in the electric map. Huh. I think most of the guides disagreed with that. Um, the other thing is that early on in the history of preservation, 
uh, you know, the northern veterans were preserving the area where the battle was fought in and around Gettysburg. And everyone who was part of the Army of the Potomac would eventually, you know, get a regimental monument on the battlefield for the most part. And, you know, I always feel uh, how did the First Corps soldiers feel about this, you know, putting a monument at a spot where they lost the fight. And um, the cavalry action, no one is preserving that area. So John Batchelder, who was the government historian up until his death in, what, 1894? I forget off the top of my head. But he, um, he was pushing for them to buy land uh, for the uh, federal government to purchase land where the cavalry battle was fought and for the GBMA to do the same. And there just wasn't enough interest in it. So they started to push this idea that the Union cavalry stopped Jeb Stuart from hitting the Union rear. And really, is the promotion of this concept by the Union veterans that fought out there so they could convince people that it was important so they could buy land, so they could put up their monuments and preserve that area. <laughs> And, and, and Custer was there, too. Yeah, and Custer's you know. there, too. Custer's very popular. <laughs> but in, you know, I am not a fan of cavalry. I don't waste my time studying a <laughs> branch of the service that suffers less than 1% or 2% total casualties in the battle. And when the fighting gets hot, they ride away, you know. Here's a great illustration of the uselessness of cavalry. Um, on July 4th, Robert Lee's forces retreating from Gettysburg. And if we believe the cavalry people, all they have to do is like contain the Southern army and we can destroy Lee's army. So Kilpatrick sends guys to Emmitsburg. Kilpatrick's guys go up and over the mountain on Monterey Gap and they cut into the Confederate retreat line and they close off the route of retreat for Lee's army. And simply put, the cavalry did exactly what they tell us they will do. They got in the rear of the Southern Army. They blocked the road. Right in the mountain pass. And yeah, sure. that should have ended right in Lee's army being surrounded and ended. But what did the cavalry do? They rode away. <laughs> and then Lee's army just continued to retreat. What the? I thought this was what I thought. <laughs> Don't tell me about cavalry. I like your, of course, what, what do they carry around with them? Yeah, giant butter knives. I, the first time Tim said that, I thought that was the funniest thing ever. Fighting with their giant butter knives. Yep, yep, yeah. Anyway, it's just, <laughs> it's just much too much is made of the Great cavalry. last question. Um, and, and again, thank you all for, for tuning in tonight. I think we're going to do this more regularly because it's a lot of fun. We don't have to do a lot of setup here because it's just a, a, a remote you know, Facebook Live program. But uh, appreciate your interest. There's been a steady, over, well over 100 people watching the whole time wow. um, and, and, and dozens and dozens of comments. So we'll keep you posted on the next time we do this and hope to see you here for some of our events this weekend and, uh, um, and the podcast that's doing their big event here, uh, Gettysburg Battle of Gettysburg podcast on Friday, September 15th. Um, that one, our tickets are, are just, I think, recently, the past week, they've become available on our website, in addition to all the other events, and the firing a cannon opportunity on Saturday, if you really would like to fire a Civil War cannon, I highly re recommend it. It is quite an experience. So um, we will sign off now, and we'll be back uh, probably in a couple weeks to, to release some more information. I will give one last teaser. We are hosting a significant number of events related to the movie Gettysburg 30th anniversary at our facility uh, on October 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, um, mostly the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which is the 13th through the 15th. There will be a lot of really, really wonderful people here, uh, and a majority of the cast of the movie is returning. Um, we're not going to say exactly who's coming, but it's pretty exciting, and we hope you'll you'll uh, you'll you'll make plans to be here if you haven't already during that weekend. Tickets are still available, by the way, for a couple of the screenings at the Majestic Theater on Friday and Sunday. Uh, the director Ron Maxwell is going to be introducing all of these screenings, and uh, there will be actor panels and signings around town. Lots of cool stuff. Lots of really amazing. Uh, guests uh, who are going to be here. So uh, we'll tell you more about that. We're going to release some tickets and uh, a full schedule of events next week. And can't uh, wait. yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So have a good night, everyone. Thanks for being with us and uh, take care. <laughs>